Wait, what? What'd you what you? they their nominal tax? But, but that's where I sent the email out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. I got that email. What's that? I got that email. Okay. He got that email. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, let's get started. Okay. All right, so barring a, a, a typo in the solutions manual, let's, um, let, let's go ahead and get started. So what I will do is I'll reassess that, uh, that typo in the solutions manual after class um, or between class and lab, and we'll figure out who got points deducted on that. That's a little, little strange. I don't, I don't understand why that would have happened because it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty rote. So. But I'm not playing, I'm not, we're not going to, uh, I'm not taking blame for that one. Now. So. <laughs> What's that? I know. I'm not taking blame for it. <laughs> I do enough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right, all right. All right. So let's, let's assess our calendar and let's make sure everybody is aware of where we're at and where we're headed. So today what we're going to do is finish our discussion of properties of hardened uh, Portland cement concrete. That's going to be pretty short. Okay? I, I don't think it's going to take more than 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, something like that. Uh, I think we'll be done with lecture probably by one-ish. Um, we'll take a, a few minutes um, and then what we're going to do is this. So today in lab, we're going to test, uh, we're going to do seven day testing of our cylinders from last week. Okay, so mix design number one, we're going to do uh, two cylinders per group and we're going to do uh, uh, compressive strength testing. So this will be our first compressive strength test in the lab. Now what we're going to do today is today I'm going to walk everybody through it, make sure that everybody's aware of how to do it, but once you know how to do the compressive strength test, and it's not just put the cylinder in and hit go. I want you to take some measurements beforehand, make sure you understand the dimensions of the cylinder, the length of the cylinder, so on and so forth, because you need that in order to compute uh, uh, compressive strength. Once I show you how to do this once, I think from here on out, I'm just going to sort of let you all do this, you know, sort of on your own. So like next week, um, we're going to be doing uh, tension testing. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, steel and, uh, and uh, alloy uh, 505 tension, spec uh, tension specimen testing. But there's also going to be some mixed design tests. I mean, we'll do this together, but I'll just sort of let you all sort of figure this out and do this part on your own, since once you know how to do it once, you should be fine to do it uh, again. So everybody okay with that? Now, we are doing mixed design number two today. Um, we've been weighing out the, uh, the aggregates uh, and whatnot. This, this second mixed design is going to utilize what's called self-consolidating concrete. So let's just put it like this. We are going to have a very soupy mix of concrete today. Um, it's going to be very, uh, very wet. Uh, we're not even going to be doing a slump test. I mean, if we did a slump test, it would just, you know. In fact, what we're doing is what's called a slump flow test. We're literally measuring uh, how, far it, uh, how far it spreads out. Um, what, I'll mention this again, but um, I'll, I'll, uh, before lab, but I'll mention this now. Self-consolidating concrete is just that. It's self-consolidating. When you cast a cylinder or when you cast a beam, you rod and you tamp the, end, or the sides of the specimen for a specific reason. You do that to consolidate the specimen. This is self-consolidating. So no rotting and no, no tamping. In fact, you're not placing it in three layers. You're literally just pouring. That's it. So be, because it's self-consolidating. That's what it's for. Okay. Um, the mixed design, I was going to tell you, the mixed design for self-consolidating concrete is very intricate and very complicated. So other than a moisture correction, I'm basically just going to say, you know, here's the ingredients, do a moisture correction. Um, what I did uh, from last week is I actually took the, the uh, absorption values, I actually cut them in half. Remember, I was using y'all's uh, absorption values. And our mixed designs last week were fine. I think they were a little on the wet side, but, but all in all, I mean, it was usable concrete. Um, but because this concrete is really going to be soupy, I said, you know what, let's just cut these in, uh, cut these in half. So this will be our last mixed design lab. So when you do your uh, lab report, uh, you know, the final homework assignment at the end of the semester, you're going to be assessing not only you know, the, the variation in compressive strength as time went on, you know, your 7, 14, and 28-day compressive strength, 
You're also going to be assessing the difference between your two mixes, okay? And I am also going to make you compare compressive strengths of all the other groups. So how did your group's compressive strength compare to the, uh, to the rest of the class? So, so there we go. Let's also uh, continue on with the schedule. This is not a typo. You have homework due on Tuesday, okay? Does it say it's due the 26th? I guess it is a typo. But I'll say this. <laughs> That's boxed. That's boxed. We'll, we'll add this to the, to the mix. Um, we'll add this to the mistake counter. However, l let, me, let me be honest with you. Whether or not I said this was due on the 24th or the 26th really doesn't matter. This homework assignment is short. I mean, it is really short. Uh, it, it should take you all of about, if it's taking you longer than an hour, I think there's something wrong. I mean, these problems are, are really short. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me whether or not it's turned in on the 24th or the 26th. And here's why. You just need to have it done for the Halloween. Because Halloween, we're having our exam review. And uh, on November 2nd, we've got our next celebration. Now, hold on. Let's assess this right now. How are we feeling about the exam on November 2nd? any other exams that day? No, I mean, do you all have your schedules? Like, let's figure this out now. We got time, so. Nice try. Nice try. Your birthday's on Halloween? What's that? Well, we're given the text. Are we going to be given that packet to go through? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I'm not worried. Yeah, yeah. The okay, well, then I'm going to. All right, all right, all right. What was your question? Okay. Oh. Well, it's the same. It's the. Do you have professors who've done that? <laughs> That's, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the packet. It'll just be blank pages. <laughs> That's just rough. <laughs> I, I don't have that much time, so no. <laughs> so no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> All right. Everybody okay for November 2nd? Oh, goodness. All right. Okay, then with that, let me, I'm going to finish our discussion of properties of hardened concrete. Some of this stuff I covered last time, but I figure it's worth discussing this time, uh, or right now. Let me go ahead and, you know, we'll, we'll move that down. It, again, it really doesn't matter because it, it's an incredibly short assignment. So, all right. Um, so, what I want to do is, uh, you know, some of this I think I already talked about, but I do want to review it a little bit. I want to talk about what? What? See, <laughs> when you all were in high school, th did the term senioritis get thrown around? Is this semesteritis? Is that what this is? <laughs> is that what this is? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Let's all just take a breath. We do have some lecture material we've got to get through, all right? Oh, my goodness. All right. Let's talk about concrete, all right? So today what I want to do is I want to review, uh, I want to review two things. So I, I want to review properties of hardened concrete because uh, some of this we are going to be assessing experimentally throughout uh, our lab. 
Some of it uh, you need to be able to compute if you're performing uh, a given type of design. Uh, for those of you who elect to take reinforced concrete design next semester, um, I mean, one of the very fundamental building blocks of our design are material properties. Now, some of those material properties are, are we pretty much treat as constant. For instance, the Young's modulus of steel, or I mean, we, we never change. It's always 29,000 KSI, because just, I mean, every time that you produce steel, I mean, that's one of the, the benchmarks. But for concrete, because concrete's uh, resultant hardened uh, properties are so uh, stringent on your, your mix proportions, you actually need to be able to assess things like compressive strength, uh, 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 Young's modulus, uh, rupture strength, so on and so forth. Um, like I said, some of this I believe I discussed in the last lecture, but I, I know it's been a while and I, and I want to review some of this. So um, let's see. So I, I believe I did talk about things like, like, uh, like change in volume as you uh, uh, cast concrete and as your moisture content changes, you can get uh, swelling and plastic shrinkage of your, uh, of your specimen. Uh, I talked about creep and then also the opposite of that, relaxation. Did I, did I mention that? About what happens in pre-stressing elements, you know, it's like a guitar string. Um, so I mentioned that last time. Uh, I discussed permeability a little bit. Um, not going to get into that in any significant detail. Um, this is where I, I believe the, the, the meat of the discussion uh, uh, originated last time when we talked about the stress strain relationship and how you know one of the biggest parameters that affects the compressor strength is obviously the water cement ratio. Um, that's a that's a really big one. As your water cement ratio goes up, your compressive strength goes down. But also your ductility does, does tend to increase. So it just depends on uh, what the, your uh, intended use is. Um, another point uh, that I mentioned is ductility. That as your compressive strength goes up, also your ductility goes down. So it's there's a similar similar relationship with water cement ratio uh, as well. There we go. All right, now this one. Uh, this is going to show up on your homework assignments, just and it's going to maybe show up on an exam. I'm not sure. So just make sure that you're aware of how this equation works. If you have, if you've already had reinforced concrete design, you're well familiar with not just this equation, but this relationship in general. The idea of use of seeing the square root of FC prime. Again. For those of you who get really, really, you know, fixated on units, I'll tell you right now, the units don't work out for this, okay? This is an empirical relationship. A lot of times in civil engineering and in engineering in general, when you have a very complex phenomenon that you must assess for design purposes, you end up having to use some degree of empirical relationships in order to, to complete your design. You see this all over the place. Um, You'll see uh, uh, empirical relationships for bearing capacity of foundations. You'll see empirical relationships for uh, open channel flow and, and friction losses in, in, in hydraulics. I mean, if anybody in here has already had hydraulic engineering, I mean, you're using all these, you know, Moody diagrams and, and Jane equations and whatnot. That's all, you know, empirical relationships. It's the same thing in structures. When you have a, uh, something that's quite complicated and you need a model to fit, that's where uh, this comes into play. This is one of them. Given a compressive strength, you can come up with an estimate for a material's Young's modulus uh, as follows. The one we're going to use more often is 57,000 square root of FC prime. Again, so that everybody's clear, you put in PSI, you get out PSI. Okay? So you do not take 57,000, like if you had 4 KSI concrete. You do not take 57,000 times the square root of 4. It's 57,000 times the square root of 4,000. And your answer will come out in PSI. Okay? So you need to be aware of that. Okay? I know the units won't work out. Trust me. Your result will. Okay? So this is going to be a, a very fundamental relationship for Young's modulus. The upper one is for any weight. You know, if you had normal weight concrete or lightweight concrete, the difference, obviously, is now you are considering the unit weight, W uh, sub C. So W sub C for your units to work out needs to be in pounds per cubic foot. Okay? Bless you. Everybody okay with this? And if you take normal weight concrete, 33 times that raised to 1.5, it comes out to around 57,000 anyway. So, Everybody good? Okay. Now, in order to experimentally assess uh, uh, properties of hardened concrete, 
Uh, there are a couple ways of doing that. What we did in the lab last week is we were assessing properties of freshly mixed concrete, slump, air content, temperature, so on and so forth. Those are properties that are only relevant before the concrete has set, before it has hardened and reached its finished condition. What we're interested in now is, okay, how do we assess a concrete uh, finished state property, it's hardened properties. Now there are two ways of doing that. We can e either we can either perform we good? We good? Oh yeah. We can either perform either destructive testing or we can perform some level of non-destructive testing. You need to be aware of both and you need to uh, understand when each uh, um, when each method I is applicable. But let me say this. I think that it's, it's generally easier to perform some degree of destructive testing. For instance, if you cast a concrete cylinder, go throw it in the testing machine, compress it until it fails. It's simple. Okay? Non-destructive testing where you need things like ultrasonics or uh, rebound hammers and whatnot, they work, but A, you have to make sure that you're, you're getting appropriate accuracy and some, sometimes, and usually in order to do that, you end up having to use equipment that's a little pricier. So, I'm not saying it's not uh, uh, it's not outside, you know, you know, the reach. It's just you need to be aware of this. That's a good question, and it depends. Um, rebound hammers, a little bit like that. If you're using some some high grade ultrasonic equipment, not bad. I mean, ultrasonics. Um, one of its main purposes is to assess the location of potential cracks. Not, I mean, not, not just on surface, but also, you know, within your given element. And that actually is not too bad, um, but rebound hammers and whatnot, a little bit. I mean, it, it'll give you results, but it, it's all about accuracy and what you're after. If you're after a rough answer, a rough test might be the way to go. If you need something a little more exact, you need to use a little bit more of an exact method. I'm not going to cover everything. There's a whole lot, you know, I mean, non-destructive testing is a field of research in and of itself, actually determining different ways to assess properties of civil engineering systems and engineering systems in general using non-destructive methods. Um, it's, a, it's a wide open field. So, everybody good? All right, compressive testing, obviously the, the, uh, the most common for, uh, for, for concrete elements. Uh, I know I've had folks, I've asked how many of you all have done sieve analyses over the summer. I asked how many of you all have done slump and air content. How many of you all did cylinder testing over the summer? So, well, so I've got a few people in here that are pretty familiar with that. It's a pretty straightforward process. It's um, uh, regularized. It, it's very standardized. It's very simple. Um, for those of you that are um, familiar with doing this in the field, one difference between how we're going to do it in the lab and how you might have done it in your um, uh, in your your office or the DOH, did you all? Um, use capping elements to actually cap the, the ends of your concrete cylinders with like that, that asphalt, you know, that sticky type substance. We're not going to do that in our lab. It's hot, it's sticky. We're not going to, we have just a, sort of a rubber cap that we're going to place on the top and bottom to get that, get that sort of level. Did you, or did you all do that? Oh, really? Okay. What's that? Well, yeah, that, that too, that too. But that's more for ensuring whether or not you have a level surface on the top and the bottom because you want your you want your cylinder to be normal to the surface and if it's tilting a little bit you can cap it using a, a an asphalt type compound we're not going to do that in the lab we're just going to use a sort of like a rubber gasket and there we go so one of those little differences between what we what the ASTM spec lists and what we do you know for your nudge nudge wink wink lab report so just something to keep in mind um, so, so a compressive test is pretty simple. There's really not, uh, there's really not much magic to it. You do a test, you test it until failure. You get a load, take the load, divide it by the cross-sectional area. You get a stress. That's all there is to it. Um, that will give you a compressive stress. We're also going to determine a modulus of rupture. Now, there's two ways of doing that. One way would actually be to test a cylinder on its side. Um, this is a, a, a method that you can use. I, um, I, I don't think you get as, as accurate of results than if you actually just passed a, a, a beam 
which is obviously what we did. We're going to take that beam, we're going to test it in, again, what we call four-point bending. We call it four-point bending because there's two-point loads uh, on the top and two support reactions uh, on the bottom. We use this laboratory setup because if you draw your moment diagram, you will find that in this central region, we get a constant moment. So it helps us ascertain that bending stress uh, in the center. Um, since we're talking about the, uh, the beams right here, I thought I would mention something uh, in the lab. There was a couple groups that did this, so I wanted to sort of draw this out. Okay. There we go. All right. So if you, okay, so when you're casting the, the beam, uh, the beams lab today, okay, so you know how you've got those metal forms, and then there's the little, like little square plates at the end? Okay, let me show you something. So, so here's, I'm looking, I'm looking at it, you know, you know, as if I'm the hel uh, in the helicopter looking down. So here's sort of that steel lip, and here's that steel lip. So the concrete would be poured in here, right? And then you've got, you know, that little, like that little square plate that goes like that, and that little square plate that goes like that. And then what a lot of people did is they had the screws tying that together like right here. Now what's the problem with that? We you can case the screws in the concrete. <laughs> so the plates need to go on the inside. So there was two groups out of six that did that. It was. So make sure you put the plates on the inside. So it wasn't that big of a deal. It took us ten minutes. Well, yeah, I, I was sitting there looking at, like, what's going on? That, oh, you know, it's, it's staring at us right in the face. Yeah, yeah, it's just staring us right in the face. Okay, so, but yeah, make sure you put your uh, screw plates on the, uh, on the inside. Okay, now, um, once you've got your beam cast and you start doing testing, you can determine the load at which it fails. So first off, cut that load in half to get the point load on your beam. Once you've got this point load and you understand uh, the dimensions, you can determine the bending moment. Uh, I've got PL over 6, but really it's just the maximum moment from your moment diagram. If you know the moment of inertia of the beam, the BH cubed over 12, sigma equals MY over I, you can get your stress. So plug and chug and PL over BH squared will give you the, uh, the modulus of rupture. And it should be around 10% of your compressive strength. So if you got a compressive strength of about 4,000 PSI, your modulus of rupture should be about 400 or something like that. Your modulus of rupture, is, if you want to know what that is, it is the stress at which your region's intention will begin to experience cracking. Okay? And it is a very fundamental quantity in uh, reinforced concrete design because it will tell us um, for a given beam what is our cracking moment. And our cracking moment is a very, uh, an initial uh, quantity that we need to assess to determine the serviceability uh, of reinforced concrete beams. For those of you who ha already had reinforced concrete design, this should probably start jogging the old memory banks. And for those of you who elect to take it next semester, this will be something that we assess quite early in the semester. So just food for thought uh, for later. Okay. Now to uh, compute the uh, uh, modulus of rupture using an empirical approach, uh, we take 7.5 times the square root of FC prime. So I'm curious, for 4,000 PSI concrete, what would the modulus of rupture be? Assuming normal weight concrete. 4,000 PSI. 474. So a little more than 10 percent, something like that. So in compression, that concrete could withstand about 4,000 PSI. In tension, about 470. Now it's 470 according to our model. Again, this is empirical. It's not exact, and so on and so forth. Yes. What? This. Okay, that's a good question. It depends on what you're talking about. This equation is used to us uh, to determine modulus of rupture from experimental results. If you don't have experimental results, you would obtain it using, using this. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. 
you know, when we're in, in a design scenario, if we're trying to design, let's say, a reinforced concrete beam or slab or so on and so forth, you know, it, if we don't have testing data, we'll just use this. Does that make sense? It's, it depends. So, so if your problem is saying, I'm in the lab and I've got this beam and here's the test and so on and so forth, well, this, you could compare this to that, but if you don't have the test data, this is going to be what you use. Does that make sense? Right. Everybody good? Okay. Um, okay. Let's talk a little bit about um, non-destructive uh, test methods. So one of the ones that isn't, um, that really isn't as accurate, but it can give you some, some rough readings is what's called a rebound hammer. And the idea is you sort of have this spring-loaded hammer uh, that's inside uh, this, this sort of probe that you see right here. And, and the idea is, you know, you, you press this sort of internal pin in with a certain amount of uh, stress, and then the spring releases and it rebounds back. And the idea is that if you can measure the amount of rebound force on the way back, you can determine how, you, know, you can almost determine the hardness of the, the surface uh, for a given concrete placement. And the idea is that you know, the, the better the concrete placement, the harder the surface, the more energy uh, would bounce back. It's not very accurate, but it'll give you a rough quality uh, assurance of a given uh, concrete mix. It's, it's pretty simplistic, but, but, it's, uh, uh, but it's out there. Um, you, can, uh, you can go a, a little further than that. You can do uh, what's called a, a, a penetration resistance test. This isn't... Let me, let me be clear. This isn't fully non-destructive. There is a little bit of destruction. You're actually penetrating inside the uh, uh, the concrete placement, but we're not, you know, drilling out core samples and actually, you know, destru destroying large segments uh, of a given uh, concrete placement. But it's there uh, and it's available. And the idea is, it's again, it's another one of those uh, hardness and in situ uh, uh, placement techniques. I would argue one of the um, the, uh, the, the best non-destructive test uh, techniques out there for concrete placements is, 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 uh, is ultrasonics. The, the idea is this. What we can do is if we can measure the speed of uh, uh, wave propagation through a given concrete placement, we can determine characteristics uh, inside uh, the concrete. So, for instance, if you have um, a really, really dense concrete placement, the waves are going to go a lot faster than if you have a loose concrete placement. So it can give you a, a really quantitative assessment of are there cracks in the concrete? Are there discontinuities in your placement? Do you have internal deterioration going on? Do you have corrosion inside? This can give you a really um, a surefire and a really accurate representation of, uh, of what's going on. Now, it, th there's a lot going on, so I, I, I want you to be clear that I don't think ultrasonics are going to work very well to give you, you know, in situ strength quantities or, or anything like that. It's really more about assessing the condition of a, you know, a, a given concrete placement. If you're looking at a, an abutment or a bridge deck or, or something like that, and you want to check and see if you've got internal degradation, if you've got cracks, if you've got issues with your placement, this is a really, a, a really good way to go. So just something so that you all are aware of the different. Uh, technologies and, and, uh, and apparatus uh, that are out there. Um, <coughs> one other uh, aspect and one other um, uh, uh, avenue that's available to you is to actually look at what's called maturity testing. I mean, you you, you kind of got to plan for this uh, a little bit because if you have a very critical concrete placement and you really want to monitor the properties over time, and when I say critical concrete placement, I'm talking about you know, some, let's say some massive bridge pier, uh, you know, on some bridge in the Ohio or, or something. I mean, we're talking like a massive structure and you've got a very critical element. You really want to assess what's going on. Well, what you could do is you could embed probes into that uh, concrete placement before you actually place the concrete. Like you can uh, embed, you know, temperature probes, uh, moisture probes, uh, so on and so forth. That, again, you got to plan for this in advance, but the advantage is, is you could actually get real-time data you know, over time. You could measure temperature over time. You could measure hydration over time. I mean, you know, if you've got um, like a mass concrete placement, actually controlling the, the temperature of that placement is, is really important. And if you've got some bridge period and you, it's 
10 foot in diameter, you can get some pretty significant changes in temperature throughout its placement. I mean, changes in temperature is going to cause expansion and contraction, which can cause cracking. This is really important to be able to assess. But again, the downside of using something like maturity testing is if you didn't plan for it beforehand, it ain't going to work down the line. So, but again, if, you, if you've got a large scale uh, uh, placement, this might be, um, might be pretty important. Any questions so far? Yes. It depends. Um, it depends. Uh, I'll say this: if you have a, a, a critical placement and you're doing regular bridge inspections, I mean, at the very least, you'd probably take readings during. And I'm using bridges as an example. You would take readings at the very least during regular interval bridge inspections. But if you're starting to notice some problems down the line, you might say, "Okay, we need to increase our inspection intervals," or we might say, "Okay, now we need to monitor it every month." so on and so forth. It, very similar to, to what's done for bridge inspections in general. Like, like for instance, if you've got a, a, a bridge that's in service, right, and it's undergoing its regular two-year inspection interval or, or something like that, and you start to notice, let's say, and let, let, let's sort of move away from concrete just to give, give you kind of an idea. Let's say you start to notice some movement on the abutment wall or some, some inclination like the abutment wall starting to go like this. You might say, okay, we're going to have to start placing some real-time monitoring. We might have to come out here and monitor this every month and, and, and get to a point where, okay, if it's starting to get too bad, we'll just shut down the bridge and start getting into replacement. Hopefully, your regular inspections start to account for that, though. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. That's a good question. Everybody else okay with this? That's good stuff. All right. So I also want to mention some other types of concrete that are available. A lot of this you've probably heard of, like how many heard of shotcrete? You've probably seen that in like uh, swimming pools or, or something like that. Um, you might have heard of flowable fill or something like that. I think I mentioned last time, you know, uh, using maybe lightweight concrete or even heavyweight uh, concrete uh, for different applications. I'm going to mention some of these uh, some of these aspects. So yes. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, there's there's plenty of uses for it. I mean, if you've uh, uh, if you've got uh, abutments or wing walls or stuff like that, it's pretty uh, useful. I mean, any time that you're trying to get a, a large placement in a very short amount of time, it, and usually, I, I, I usually see shotcrete used more for wall type applications, but uh, that doesn't mean it couldn't be used anywhere else. I mean, but usually everywhere I've seen shotcrete a applied is for walls. So that's why I think swimming pools, because you've got your reinforcement set out and you can just do that. But yeah, this is good stuff. Any other, any other questions? OK. Um, so today, we are going to deal with uh, self-consolidating concrete. It is very soupy. It is very flowable. Um, the, the advantage is that because of its chemical consistency, so the idea is that the admixtures, the super P, the, the, the different, you know, the fly ash and the microsilicates that we're going to throw into the mix today, the idea is that they keep our aggregate suspended to where um, the, the bond between the aggregate and the cement paste isn't as strong as it would normally be, so it flows a, a, a lot better. So that's the, 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 um, the, the, the upside. It's easily pumped. Um, it fills your surfaces and your crevices uh, quite well, but um, you kind of have to work with it a little faster, which is why we're doing this for mixed design two and not mixed design one. It is going to take a little longer to mix because there's more ingredients. So just something to keep in mind. Now, at least for our laboratory purposes, because it's self-consolidating, we don't have to rot our specimens. Just fill your cylinders up, strike them off, and you're done. So it makes that kind of nice. Um, <coughs> now, uh, in order to, to do a, a self-consolidated mix, the actual mechanics and, and, and uh, and details behind performing a self-consolidated concrete mix are pretty intricate and pretty complex, so I'm not going to make you all do that. The only thing that you really need to uh, uh, be aware of is that we're going to be adding some super P in order to get some, uh, or some high range water reducer to get uh, that self-consolidating consistency, and we're also going to be increasing our fine content, so there's uh, uh, a lot more sand that goes into this mix, and we also have our microsilicates and so on and so forth, so, and we also have more cement that goes into this mix. We only had about, I think it was 26 pounds in the last mix, and we have 31 pounds in this mix. If you do a slump test, 
it will just go all over the place. In fact, you do not perform a slump test on self-consolidated uh, concrete. You actually perform a slump flow test. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our cone, flip it upside down to where it's open like this, just fill it, no rotting necessary because it self-consolidates, lift it in the same fashion, and we are going to measure the flow. And we're actually going to do this twice, okay? One of these we're going to do unobstructed, just as is, and the second test we're going to do, we're going to perform with that J ring. Remember the steel ring with the posts on it? That'll give you an idea of the difference between how this material flows unobstructed and then how it would flow in the midst of a bunch of reinforcement and form work and so on and so forth. So between the two, you can get an understanding of how it's going to, uh, how it's going to perform. Um, there are also some other uh, different types of concrete that would be used for given applications. So flowable fill, how many of you have heard of that? Okay. So first off, if you look at the compressive strength of flowable fill, it's horrible. All right, we're like 50 PSI, 100 PSI. But it's not meant for structural applications. That's not what it's for. Okay? It's not meant for a beam in a building or a slab in a building that's going to be subjected to significant shears and moments. That's not what it is. It's really meant for more like backfill type material behind an abutment, between some culverts, uh, something like that. Literally just filler. So, uh, you know, bedding for pipes, uh, you know, you might find it, you know, filling areas uh, in, in foundation or geotech work, but it's not meant for load, uh, uh, load demand. That, it's just literally filler. So, just something to be aware of. Shotcrete, um, if you look at shotcrete mixes, you'll find that it's, it's a, a, um, uh, a concrete mix, but if you've ever worked with uh, shotcrete, you will find it's very dry. Okay. Shotcrete tends to be a, a very dry application. You might have some uh, polypropylene fibers or something like that added into the mix to get you that strength and ductility that you need. Uh, it might be called gunite or sprayed concrete. But yeah, I, every application that I've ever seen shotcrete used for has been for more vertical applications, walls and, uh, and things like that. Just because of its nature to be shot and stick, it works uh, pretty well uh, in those applications. Uh, lightweight concrete, who, who are these folks, I wonder? This looks like Marshall University's concrete canoe team. Um, so just so you all aware, for those of you who are interested in the concrete canoe competition, how many of you are interested? There we go. Thank good. Good. Oh my goodness. Um, typically in practice, if you need lightweight concrete, you're typically going to get around uh, something like 115 pounds per cubic foot, that's a good uh, um, value that you would see like in actual practice. I mean, if we've got very significant structural loads on, on a given system, you know, really high-rise buildings or, or something like that, and we really need to start trimming down uh, the dead load in order to achieve an economical design, then utilizing lightweight concrete might make a little more sense. It's a little more expensive, but if you need to shave that load off, this might be the way to do it. Now it is very now now like I said in practice and when I say in practice I mean like real applications real civil engineering applications 115 pounds per cubic foot is what you're going to want to use. Now if you uh, uh, are working on something like the concrete canoe competition, typically your goal is to try and achieve a concrete mix that has a unit weight less than 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Okay which is possible. It is very possible. You end up replacing your aggregate with these really porous like glass spheres, uh, the, the expanded glass spheres, and um, they are very, very light and very, very fine and will uh, decrease the weight of your, your mix uh, substantially. And if you can get your, uh, your, your concrete canoe to utilize a concrete that's less than 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, it will always float. In fact, one of the, for those of you who are interested in the competition, one of the um, make or break tests that is performed uh, during, the, uh, during the competition is what's called the swamp test. Okay? They literally take your canoe, they sink it underwater, and let it go, and it's supposed to float back up. Okay? It's supposed to. <laughs> All right? You achieve that one of two ways. You either use a mix with a unit weight less than 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, or you actually 
uh, have sort of a hollow section here in the ends and you cast them such that the, the internals is hollow and by hollow usually we use a big foam core and then that foam core maybe your concrete the actual mix is heavier than 62.4 pounds per cubic foot but the entire canoe is less than 62.4 pounds per cubic foot raises back up so so yeah you ought to be thinking about that it's a lot of fun it's a lot of work but it's a lot of fun um, heavy uh, weight concrete and high strength concrete um, Again, I mentioned some reasons why you might want to use heavyweight concrete, either in a nuclear application or maybe if you have some sort of medical unit and you're trying to control contamination, heavyweight concrete might make the, uh, uh, might make the most sense. There are, you end up using heavier aggregates. That's sort of how it, it works. There are some problems with using heavyweight uh, concrete. If you've got heavyweight aggregates, you tend to want to separate from the cement paste. So you'll have some weak spots, so you kind of got to keep that stuff mixing, which is tough because it's heavy. <laughs> so you, ha you have, to, have to keep that worked. Um, high strength concrete is also applicable in given applications. Usually, if I say high strength concrete, I'm saying anything higher than 6,000 PSI. Uh, it usually requires a very low water cement ratio in order to get that strength, but in order to get that, you have to add some super P to make it workable. Um, very common in pre-stressed applications to use high strength concrete, uh, so just something to be aware of. Um, fiber reinforced concrete, how many of you have heard of that? Okay, so fiber reinforced concrete is a very common application, it's becoming more common uh, nowadays. Um, instead of using welded wire to uh, provide surface reinforcement or temperature reinforcement, um, to, to backtrack a little bit, um, if you're doing let's say slab work or deck work on, on bridges or slab work in buildings. We typically provide two types of reinforcement. We'll provide main reinforcement to safely resist the, uh, the moments and shear so the building doesn't fall down or the bridge doesn't fall down. But we also provide temperature reinforcement to prevent cracking due to thermal expansion and, and shrinkage and so on and so forth. And one way of getting around that is to actually use fiber reinforced concrete. We throw in polypropylene or fiberglass fibers this is kind of an idea of what they look like, and that bonds with the uh, given mix and creates a pretty high-strength uh, product. Uh, this is some pretty, uh, pretty nifty stuff. I, I couldn't help but show you this one at the end. Um, what's getting a lot of traction uh, nowadays is actually high-strength and, and our high-performance and ultra-high-performance concrete. This uh, right here, this image on the left, this is the reason that I'm Dr. Michelson instead of Mr. Michelson. This was the, uh, the, con uh, the concept uh, behind the, my PhD. We were basically developing um, uh, press break form steel tub girders for short span bridge applications. The idea is that instead of cutting and welding a steel girder together, the idea is you take a standard mill plate directly from the mill or the service center and using a large capacity press break, just bend it uh, four times into a U-shaped tub, cast a concrete deck on it, ship the whole composite unit to site. Set it down, close this up with a UHPC closure pour, you can have your whole superstructure done in a day, as opposed to how long it takes you know, owner agencies to put bridges up now. Yes? Do you still have to do shear stud rebound test? Yeah, yeah shear, uh, shear stud rebound test, yeah. But that, I mean, that's just QAQC with bridges in general. What, what he's talking about is when you shoot shear studs on a, um, uh, on a steel uh, bridge girder, there's a quality assurance test uh, that happens where they randomly pick a few studs and actually you know, whack on them to ensure that they actually have properly bonded to the, uh, uh, properly bonded to the, uh, to the steel. But that's usually, hopefully, not a big deal. These stud placements are pretty regular. Uh, we've got our studs every 12 inches, so it's not complicated, so it usually goes uh, pretty fast and that ups the QAQC factor quite a bit. Um, but the reason why I bring this up is because we actually mixed some UHPC and closed up uh, two of these uh, sections in the lab. You can see we've cast one here and we're getting ready to cast another. We slid the sections together after they cured and you can see how we're pouring in this UHPC. I'll be honest, UHPC is expensive. It really is. but. The benefit that you get from it is a time saver. Usually, UHPC is really uh, better used for closure pours if you're trying to join together. I mean, you only need about a, like a little more than a cubic yard per pour uh, for this given geometry, but it goes super fast. So again, 
you can have your bridge superstructure done you know, in a matter of days. If these are already cast, set them down, slide them together, form it up, pour, you're done. So, yeah. So why didn't you use the ultra high performance concrete there in the middle? Because based on the dimensions, you only have a six inch range in order to fully develop the strength of the concrete on either end. So what you need is you need a joint here that's strong enough to mimic the strength of these two decks in such a short space. So you need some bulky concrete. Actually, one thing that's also kind of interesting, um, the reinforcement doesn't affect the strength of this joint as much as this surface condition. If this was like super smooth right here, the joint would fail. You actually have to have a roughened surface, like a pitted surface, in order for that to bond. So the way that we generate that uh, in, in the real world is when you form up those precast units, you use what's called a form release retarder. It's the same thing that they use on architectural precast panels. You rip that off and put a uh, pressure washer to it. It comes right off. So pretty nifty. Regular concrete? Regular. Yep. Yep. Oh, each of these modules? These modules are about seven and a half foot wide. The reason why they're seven and a half foot wide is that's about the maximum width that you can get on a truck and not have to deal with special permitting requirements on shipping. Uh, and you can have about four of these, four to five of these will form an entire bridge. So you can truck them out, lift them in, slide them, pour, and you're done. That's, that was the main motivator, motivator behind this project was ABC. Because ABC, for those of you who are uh, uh, interested in delving into the bridge field, accelerated bridge construction or ABC is becoming a very big motivator uh, in the bridge industry. The idea is if you can get your bridge in faster uh, at, you know, using new modular techniques, the federal government is going to give you incentives on that, i.e. money. So. Well, that, that too. Um, there, see, we'll try and choose my words carefully. If there has been resistance to that movement, the resistance has been from the contractors because when they bid, they like to put hours in their bid. And when suddenly they're not able to put as many hours because they've got this accelerated product, they're not very happy about it. But honestly, you just, the way I look at it is, you know, with this uh, technology, you can get just as many hours, you're just precasting, you know, at the fabrication plant or at the precasting yard or off off to the side instead of casting on the uh, uh, on the actual bridge deck. I mean, it takes just as many hours to tie up the rebar and cast the form or you know build the forms and cast. Yes. Do you think the lifespan of these is going to be possible in just five years, or is it going to be broken? We did fatigue testing on these where we took the fatigue truck under this large capacity actuator and literally did this for enough cycles to simulate 75 years. It was just strong at the very beginning as it was at the end. So, yeah. We actually, so to answer your question, we did that. It took months, but we did it. <laughs> this is a lot of fun, too. I wish I had the presentation. I'll show you. So. I will. I'll show you. But I've got a little video clip where I've got it loaded. It, we had to do it, we did it at about one hertz because we couldn't load it any faster. I mean, we're going from zero to about 70 kips, like once a second, and literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week until we simulated 75 years of design line, so months. And we stopped it periodically and did a static test to see how does it change from, you know, day one to after 100,000 cycles, after 500,000 cycles, after a million cycles, and it was literally getting kind of boring because we were just doing the same test over and over again, getting the same results, you know. What? Yeah, we wanted it to be boring. We we didn't want it to, to fail. Like, <laughs> I think it is because it's faster. Well, it, it's not so much better. What I'm saying is it exhibits the same properties. That's what I'm saying. This is good stuff. Any questions? It's not quite 1 o'clock, is it? I talked too long, didn't I? What time is it? 1.29? Okay, let's...
Let's call, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll get together back at around 140 and we'll uh, start doing some testing. Does that sound good? All right. Hold on.